the Game of Life podcast coming at you, where we bring to you the behind the scenes lives of NBA players, business savvy entrepreneurs, and top level performers in all fields of personal development. The podcast that helps you become the best version of you. The Game of Life, David Nurse. Here we go. Konnichiwa. How we doing? How we doing? It's about all the Japanese I know, but welcome back for another week of the Game of Life with David Nurse, where we bring to you behind the scenes life of elite NBA players, the habits, tricks, biohacks of top level performers in all fields, inside the minds of Fortune 500 business savvy entrepreneurs, the latest from cutting edge companies changing the world in the performance field, how to live an adventurous, exciting, extraordinary life, how to find joy in every day, find your life calling and purpose, and just overall how to help you become the best version of you. That's what we are bringing to you every week in a nutshell on the game of life. This week we've got an awesome guest for you. Literally since this podcast birth, I've been wanting to have him on and this week we've lassoed him in. Got him. One of the most overall talented people I know the only person I'd let read bedtime stories to me, other than Morgan Freeman, of course, extremely accomplished, Emmy Award winning, and who I'm very blessed to be able to call a good friend, Ian Eagle. Basically, if you watch any sport on the thing called the television, you have probably heard his voice and been mesmerized by it, like me. His story, one of the most motivational I've heard, true inspiration of what it means to follow your dreams, never let anyone tell you no, and how to prepare every day to be the best individual, the best in his field, and just the epitome of a super high level performer that's making a positive impact on society. All right, got to tell you about my guys at Halo Neuroscience. They are changing the game in sports development and really overall brain stimulation and high-level learning. Halo was a next-level human performance development that increases muscle memory, brain focus functionality, neurons flying around, synapsing all over the place, just making you all kinds of awesome. That's my best explanation. Seriously, if you want to improve at anything in life, check them out. And Halo's given me the opportunity to give you a big, fat discount on having your own Halo headphones. And being just like Steph Curry, who is about to win another NBA Finals, so if he's doing it, yeah, I'm doing it. Go to haloneuro.com and enter the code DAVID125. This will get you $125 off your headphones for yourself. I'm going to link to all this in the show notes. Make sure you know exactly how to do it and get at it. All right, now it's time. Spread your wings, Iron Eagle coming at you. See what I did there? More of my stand-up comedy routine. Sure to get tomatoes thrown at me. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the good stuff. Here we go. Okay, we are super lucky to have Iron Eagle, the bird man on the podcast, the best voice in the game, in sports, in my opinion, in anything, like I could just listen to you give me bedtime stories. Um, <laughs> you're like Morgan Freeman to me, man. <laughs> David, for the right price, we can make that happen. I, I really, I have no shame. You want me to read you a bedtime story? Uh, I could set up an account, and, and you can just funnel money into it. That's not a problem for me. Let's do that, man. There's got to be some kind of app we could create from that, like your podcast of bedtime stories. <laughs> If, if anybody could do it, it's you. You are a creative human being. Appreciate that, man. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let's hop into it here on the game of life. Just uh, fill us fill us in, fill the audience in on where you are, uh, how you got to where you are today. Just the cliff notes, everything you. Yeah. Wow. A topic know, I'm so a uncomfortable with, David. <laughs> I've been doing the NBA for 23 years. I got the Nets radio job in 1994 at at 25 years old. I did the radio for a year. I moved to TV the year after that. I've been doing the NFL play-by-play on CBS for the last 19 years. I did the Jets 
prior to that on the radio and then transitioned to a network job. NCAA tournament, uh, I've worked the last 20 years. I've been doing Westwood One NFL football for the last nine years, uh, French Open tennis for the last 12 years. I uh, worked in sports radio when I got out of Syracuse University back in 1990, so that's really where I got my start. You know, my parents were entertainers. My father was a stand-up comedian. My mother was a singer and actress. So at a young age, my idea of a normal existence was probably very different than everybody else. They were on the road a lot. I traveled with them a great deal. And because of that, I was encouraged to pursue whatever my dreams were. I was never discouraged when I told my dad at a young age that I wanted to do this. And I was you know, about seven or eight years old when I told him that. He said, well, then that's what you'll do. So when you're emboldened in that way, when the person that you have the most respect for in life and is the hardest worker you've ever seen tells you that that's what you'll do, then you believe it. And even though I had no training in it until I got to college, the only broadcasting I was doing was either in my bedroom with baseball cards, creating fictitious games, or in my shower where there were incredible acoustics. <laughs> that was it. That's, that was the extent of my broadcast experience. I got to Syracuse University, very competitive environment. And I was in a place where it appealed to young people that also had an aptitude for this. And I got to compare myself to others that also had a dream and were fully immersed in this, just like I was. So it was a tremendous training ground. And I look back on those years, formative years for me, as incredibly important and necessary for me getting to where eventually I got to. I, I absolutely got a taste of this at a young age based on so many different elements that were happening in my life, but I always had a visual that I could do it. And maybe it was blind faith. Uh, maybe it was naivete. It might have been a combination of all of the above, but there, there certainly was something inside me that, that always felt, you know what, I can do that and I will do that one day. Man, that's really cool to hear. That's just like having the empowerment of knowing that there's nothing that you can't do that you put your mind to. And if you have that, as you can see, you can definitely do it. So that's a big time thing to tell the audience. Yeah, and, and you know, David... Uh, the part for me, which I look back on now and I can reconcile and realize, is there was definitely a performance aspect to my personality. I uh, liked the idea of getting in front of people, whether it was school plays, uh, whether it was presentations. That never seemed foreign or intimidating to me. So melding those worlds of being comfortable uh, speaking, being comfortable presenting yourself, and then putting a headset on, talking into a microphone, being told that you have five seconds until it's time to do your job, and then yeah. it's go time. And again, with the background of my parents, I watched my dad, who not only was a stand-up comedian, but was a trumpet player and an actor, had been in films and television and many commercials. Uh, that also was very powerful to me, that it, it could be done. That uh, This was a guy that, that I, I lived with and I knew as well as anybody, but at a moment's notice, he could snap his fingers and go into performance mode, whether it was on stage, whether it was in front of a group of people. He was a commercial actor and got this spot back in 1977 for Xerox where he played a chubby monk. And... <laughs> Uh, it was a very famous commercial. It was the first commercial that used a religious figure. And the the end of the commercial was he looked up to the sky and, and said, it's a miracle. And this commercial ended up winning multiple Clio Awards, which is the equivalent of an Emmy or an Academy Award or a Grammy Award or a mm -hmm. Tony mm -hmm. in the commercial vein. And Xerox ended up hiring him to represent the company for – some years, up to 210 days a year, making personal appearances in the monk outfit at Kinko's or if they 
Uh, Xerox did a deal with Chrysler. He would go to Detroit to their home offices because they just put in 12 copiers. And he would spend the day there making people feel good, spreading joy and laughter and happiness. What they didn't know when they hired him was that he just had a natural way with people. And that ability transferred over to the corporate world. And he ended up doing that for about 12, 13 years. It became this completely second career to him when he least expected it. And just being a, a, a person that saw all of that developed, I realized that things don't always go as you predict and you have to be able to uh, be flexible and be open to something new and different. And I've always tried to maintain that mentality in, in every assignment that I get. Even though I had never done boxing, I went and did it because I knew it was a good opportunity or track and field or tennis or golf or volleyball. All these other assignments that I've taken through the years, David, has been mm-hmm. based solely on the fact that I said yes and I was willing to take a risk and take a chance on something that I didn't necessarily have a deep background in. Wow. Yeah. Willing to take that step, that risk and knowing that you're going to grow from it, not having that fear. And that's, that's, that's such a big point. Like a lot of people will just have the fear of just a huge fear of just public speaking, just getting out there and and just putting themselves out there, like risking it because they're afraid of failure. Um, And what do they say? Many people, most, most people would rather die than talk in public. Yeah, Crazy. yeah, that 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 is that's always been amazing to me. But I think it's one of those things. If it's not in you, you have to really yeah. make an effort to try to uh, find a happy place in those moments. Look, I get it. We all have strengths and weaknesses, and I can't just assume that somebody is comfortable in that setting because I am. What I would tell somebody that that does fear that is uh, that's okay. You can use that to your advantage. You can use nervousness as a way to motivate. You can use it as a way to diffuse once you get up there. The bottom line is if you know your subject matter, that's the first box you have to check. Are you confident? Are you credible in what it is you're speaking about? The second part is know your audience. Mm -hmm. That that variable changes all the time. So if you have a set presentation, if you're a stand-up comedian, let's say, and you've got your set that works all the time, but all of a sudden you get an audience that isn't quite getting it, well, you have to be able to adjust. You have to be able to, in the moment, recognize that you're going to have to make some tweaks based on the fact that your audience is different and they're seeing it through a different prism than what your normal audience might see it. So that's the second part. The third part is just being comfortable and uh, taking a deep breath before it's time to do it and visualizing. That's a big part for me uh, before I started doing this, and I'm sure it it plays into what you do as well uh, in, in trying to help people with their game and with their shooting specifically, something that is about repetition can you visualize that this is going to be successful before you give a speech of any sort? You better visualize this thing going well. Yeah. And you know the other part, too, is in addition to knowing your audience, it's also putting yourself in that position. I would equate it very similar to doing a broadcast in that my goal is to entertain and to inform. And in the middle of a game, I will remind myself, if I was at home watching this game or if I was in the car listening to this game, am I giving the audience what they need to best enjoy the action? And that's on you to take stock, to to consider the listener, to consider the viewer. Those that are selfish, those that get caught up in their own world, often forget about the experience for anybody else. So if you're giving a speech the easy part to me is, okay, let's switch places. If I was in the audience, would this be of interest to me? Would I be engaging? Would I be connecting with the person that's, that's giving the speech? And now I'm in the position of giving that speech. I've got to be aware and I've got to make sure that I'm doing everything in my power to fulfill that responsibility. Uh, so it's, it's being able to, uh, 
be malleable in the moment, but also having a bigger picture understanding of, well, why are you there? And what are you doing this for? And who are you doing it for Good point. in the moment? Yeah, those are, those are all awesome points, man. And, and, and just hearing that as like, what was really cool last year when I was with, with Brooklyn out there is that every time, one story I remember, every time I stepped on the bus, like you would be there. And you'd have a big smile on your face. You'd always be positive. You'd always be bringing people up. You had that. You had that aura about you that you knew. I mean, you knew how to positively encourage everybody. You knew your audience, and I mean, you just take what you do in your profession, and it's. I mean, just who you are in life. So it's like you become so good of what you've done. It's. I mean, it just reflects in everything that you do, and it's. I mean, it's huge credit to you, and it's awesome to see. Yeah, you know, David, you you have a very similar disposition, just getting to know you over the course of that year. Life is reflective in many ways. It really is what you put out there. People attach to that. And we all know people in our day-to-day lives that are negative or naturally downtrodden. And that often sticks with them and it Mm -hmm. lingers. And then they don't understand why things aren't going well. And life often will give you back what you put into it. I, I really yep. believe that. Um, so it, it is it is something that, that I'm very much aware of and cognizant of. Look, it's a bus full of NBA stars. I'm not going to try to take over the dynamic. You've got players, and there have been plenty of them in the 23 years that I've been with the Nets, that have large personalities, and you know what your <laughs> yeah. place is. Yep. And you understand where you fit in. But you also know that in the moment, if it's required, uh, that being positive, being a good person, it shouldn't be hard. I mean, to me, that's always been my natural instinct. To me, being being a prick is difficult, like being mean <laughs> to someone. And I know yeah. for some people that comes very naturally. That's never come naturally to me. That's hard for me uh, to, to put negative into the world. And you hope that, that people can attach to that in some way. And when they do, maybe they carry some of that positivity with them. For me also, David, because I work with so many different partners through the years, uh, NFL, NBA, all the various sports I cover, I've always felt, look, my job is to get the most out of whoever it is sitting next to me, no matter what their personality is. Mm -hmm. And, the people at home watching the game or uh, people that might be listening on the radio, whatever venue I'm working, they don't want to know the backstory. They don't care about the backstory. They don't care uh, whether or not I had a rough day or if I had a bad room in the hotel, it was right next to the elevator shaft and it woke me. It's irrelevant once you get on the air. So my only job at that point is to, Uh, create chemistry with my partner, create good, natural conversation. And the hope is that people feel like, in a way, they're eavesdropping on two people talking hoops. Uh, That's that's really it. I mean, when when you want to get down to the essence of it, when somebody's watching a basketball game, uh, they want to feel like they're part of it. They don't want to feel like they're on the outside looking in. So I've done everything in my power through the years to adjust based on what my partner needs and do everything I can to highlight their best traits. Because if their best traits are highlighted, we both come across well. We're judged as a team. We're not judged individually. I like that guy, but I don't like that guy. When people watch games or listen to games, they judge you based on how that conversation is coming across. And the goal is for it to be fluid and for it to be lively, and if you can inform and enlighten along the way, and then have a couple laughs and have some levity, uh, that's that's where you separate yourself from from the rest of the crews that are doing this. Yeah, that's that's big time, man. Um, and you're at, you're at the top of your game. Obviously, to me, you're the best in the game. And what are what are some ways as a, a top level level performer that you that you make sure that you're continuing to grow and and learn on a daily basis? Yeah, for me, uh, more than anything else, uh, 
this is a given, but you better know your stuff. Yeah. If you're not prepared, right. especially in this day and age, David, uh, people are going to sniff it out. I think there was a time in this business where information was hard to come by and broadcasters maybe were privy to more than the average fan. Those days have changed with the internet, the way that uh, things are set up. It's at everybody's fingertips. So you better be on top of your game because there's somebody out there that knows their stuff well and uh, they'll poke holes if, yeah. if, you're, if you're trying to cut corners. They'll figure it out. They'll sniff it out. So that's the first part. Uh, and that's got to be a given. Uh, that yeah. shouldn't even come up in discussion, but it does come up just based on the fact that you know, some, some people don't do their due diligence. They're, they're not fully prepared for the event that they're covering. Then the second part is uh, being natural in, in who you are, in what you bring to the table. Don't try to be something that you're not. I, I try to bring enthusiasm to the game because – I'm naturally enthusiastic. Like that's real. That's yeah. organic. Oh, yeah. That's coming from a real place. Uh, you can't fake that game in and game out. So when something exciting happens, that's the true fan in me coming out. Uh, you, you've been around it. The NBA, something special could happen on any possession. There's a chance you might see something that you haven't seen before, a particular move, a particular play, a, a particular bounce of the ball. So as a play-by-play -play announcer, you better be ready for it. Don't get caught up in your stuff and lose sight of what the, the role is. My role is to be a conduit for the fans, for uh, what's happening in the game, and to provide some connective tissue uh, for the, the viewers at home. Um, so staying on top of my game and, and staying – uh, as good as I can be is is really staying in the moment, is not losing sight of that, treating every game like it's important, because it is. It's important to somebody. And the other part, too, David, this, this has never been lost on me, even after doing this for all these years. I never assume that somebody that's tuning in knows my work, knows me, is familiar with what I do. They're forming opinions based on a very small sample size. And that's always kept me sharp because you can't take any of it for granted. If I'm doing second quarter Nets and Sacramento Kings, and I think for a moment, well, who's watching? Who yeah. cares? How many people are awake on the East Coast? That's when mistakes occur. That's when uh, you lose a little bit of your edge. So no matter what the assignment is, no matter what the game, no matter what moment it is, it could be a blowout. It doesn't matter. You still have to give your A effort, and I've just always assumed that there's somebody watching that uh, is is in that moment forming an opinion on me, so I better be at my best. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's like uh, the Michael Jordan thing where he, he imagines that every single night he played that no one had seen him play in the audience before when he was playing for yep. every single one of those people. That's really yep. cool, man. Same okay. mentality. You're the Michael Jordan of, uh, of broadcasting. Man. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's nice. the new label. Nice. I like, I like that jump. Yes. <laughs> Big time stuff right there. Told you about his voice. You'd think I was kidding about trademarking Ian's bedtime storytelling app. I'm doing it. Super cool to hear the inspiration from Ian. Having a dream, having a goal and taking a step every day to reach that goal. It's just so cool to know that really anyone can do what they set their mind to. And I know you might be thinking, okay, David, that sounds cliche, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know you can, I'm living proof, Ian's living proof. It's all about not being afraid to take a risk, being comfortable in your own skin and who you are and realizing failure is only failure if you don't take a chance. All right, I'm going to hit you with my three-pointers of the week. And since we arguably have one of the best sports broadcasters of all time on the podcast this week, we're going to stick with the theme of sporting events. I'm going to hit you with the top three sporting events I've been to personally, the top three rivalries you might not know of, and I'll throw in one of my bucket lists that I want to get to. My three top sporting events that I have attended, number three is a tie between watching sumo wrestling in Osaka, Japan with old ladies drinking green tea and our legs crossed, speaking no English. 
He did soccer games in the slums of Brazil and watching Manny Pacquiao coach and play for his basketball team that he is also the GM for. Yep, not a whole lot else you can say about that. Number two is the Kentucky Derby, the best two minutes in all of sports and the most interesting diversification of fans that you can have. People on the infield with kegs of beer or high-class mint julep drinkers with big old hats. And number one, the Olympics. I was at the London Olympics 2012. The coolest atmosphere ever. It's like the Truman Show all in one bubble. Everybody going for their country like Small World from Disneyland with crazy passion. I remember being at a handball game, third place women's handball game randomly, Hungary versus South Korea, and it was probably the best atmosphere I've ever seen. Now the top three sporting rivalries you might not know about. Number three, Australia versus New Zealand rugby. Number two, India versus Pakistan cricket. And number one, Kobayashi versus Joey Chestnut in the Nathan's 4th of July hot dog eating contest. Trust me, it's intense. In the sporting event, number one on my bucket list, thanks to John Levy from the previous podcast, is running with the Bulls in Pamplona, Spain. I don't really want to get crushed, though, but I like to run with them and then chicken out and jump out of the way. There it is, your three-pointers of the week. All right, second half, let's go. Back to the podcast, The Game of Life, with Ian's favorite events he has broadcast, being NBA Jam's voice, winning an Emmy, sneaking into NBA pre-game media food, eating beef stroganoff, and rapid-fire questions that I'm going to hit him with, quotes to live by, three people he would invite to a dinner party. Would he rap? Would he be an actor? What would he be if he wasn't a broadcaster? And then just really life lessons to live by, to better yourself, make yourself the best version of who you are. Never forget who you are and the journey you have been on. It's all about enjoying the journey and the process. Ian hits you with some drop the mic type answers. They're coming at you. Kambawa. Hey, uh, what are some of your favorite events that you've announced? I know you list this, like, Every single, I should say, what announce have you not announced, basically? Yeah, you know, I, I've never had the chance to do a Super Bowl. I, I was part of the CBS team that worked Super Bowl 50 in Santa Clara. I was one of the hosts on a side set working with uh, Brandon Marshall and Boomer Esiason joined us uh, later on in the broadcast. Uh, so that that was a thrill just to be a part of it, but I would say that's a career goal to, to yeah. one day call a Super Bowl. I've been really fortunate on the NBA side to call a number of NBA finals for mm. the world feed. Uh, I I don't know if I could walk the streets of the Philippines, David, without a, a mop scene. <laughs> I, I'm huge in the Philippines and Indonesia. Yep, I know, man. I'd yep. love to go down there with you. That basketball pass oh, is out of control. That would be, that would be huge. I'm so, a yeah, superstar I, down there. That's I know crazy. you are. Man. I know you're on. So I ended up doing a bunch of finals uh, through the years, the Jordan years, Akeem Elijah won, um, Miami in the finals with San Antonio. I had uh, Gary Payton, Sean Kemp, a stretch there, Malone and Stockton. Uh, so really lucky that I, I just got to be a part of it. Same thing with the NCAA championship. I called that Duke Butler game on the world feed. Uh, when Hayward nearly hit the shot of the century. Yep. And I think it would have been the, the greatest upset in sports history. And that's even taking into account U.S. versus Russia in the 1980 Olympics and Villanova, Georgetown, and, and other great upsets in sports history. I think that might have been number one if it ended the way that it could have ended with a half-court he from Hayward. Uh, that would have been something special, but it was a fantastic game. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the variety uh, in my career, and, and I hope it continues. I, I don't. I don't want to be just limited to basketball and football. I'm. I'm still open to the idea of calling other things and and opening up new doors if if they come up. But it, it's hard to match that championship feel. There's something yeah. about it. There's an energy. Uh, there's a, a stress level, but in a positive way even as a broadcaster that you feel before the event. Uh, I know, of course, we focus on the athletes, and rightfully so. I, I just recently worked that Game 7 
Boston and Washington Mm -hmm. and the buildup for that because for one of those two franchises, it was going to be big moving on to the conference finals and validating their respective seasons for a broadcaster. It's a big moment. You know, it's a big deal. You know that these games will live on forever. And even the NCAA tournament, David, for me, and I've always viewed it this way, things have changed uh, with technology. But when I first started doing the NCAA tournament, I always thought to myself, uh, even the smaller schools that were playing in it, uh, there are young players in this tournament that this is the limit. This is as far as they're going to go. They're not going to play professionally. They're not going to play in the NBA. This is the biggest game of their lives. And one day, I always thought of this when I started doing it in 1998, they're going to put in, at the time, a VHS or a DVD and watch this game with their Mm -hmm. grandkids. And I want to make sure I do right by it, that I do it justice, that I've done the proper preparation, that I've done the work on Nickel State or Alabama State or Utah State or whoever it might be, one Mm -hmm. of those smaller Mm -hmm. schools, and that I've done the biographical information, that I am prepared and I'm telling the right stories and I'm providing the right themes and context for the viewer so that they could watch this game back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from the moment and say, okay, I, I, I got a feel for this. That's a big responsibility. Whether or not others feel that way, I don't know. But I've always felt that way, and, and it's helped me feel the importance of the moment no matter what the assignment. Man, that's really cool. And, and what uh, people might not know is, too, you won an Emmy and were the voice of NBA Jam? <laughs> yeah. I've done, a, I've done a few video games, which has been cool. I'm in a new one now, uh, NBA Playground. Okay. So if you want to check that out, that's, that's a little different. And I uh, did a bunch of video games in the past. I do this voiceover uh, for NBA action that's on in the U.S., but also on in a lot of different countries around the world. So it's allowed me to to branch out and do some other things. Yeah, the Emmy Awards, look, I I got into this business with the idea that I would get a free pass to the games. <laughs> that was my first thought. Like, wow, wait, wait a second. So you get to sit in the front row and that's that's free, right? No, they, you don't have to pay. Like, no, no, that's free. That's, that's where you sit. So that, that was my first thought. Like, oh, that's cool that I could do that. Then the next thought was, oh, wait, you get to travel with the team and that, that's that's a whole other experience. And that's anything crazy. that's come beyond that, David, has been yeah. complete gravy uh, Emmy Awards with the Nets has, has been such an honor because I think New York has incredible sportscasters. And then you know, recently, a few years ago, I was nominated for a National Emmy for play-by-play, Man. which really was uh, a, a proud achievement just to be mentioned with uh, the others that were up for the award, people that I, I grew up idolizing and emulating in so many ways. This is not something that happened by accident. It wasn't like... I wanted to be a dentist, and then uh, I made a 180-degree turn to become a broadcaster. This is truly all I ever wanted to do. So to to get a chance to do it and to make a living and to provide for my family and to travel around the country and around the world doing these different events – uh, it's it's been everything that that I hope for and and even more. Man, that's so cool to see someone's like for any young kid listening out there having that passion of that's what you want to do, following your passion, not letting anybody tell you no, and then just being at the top of the game of it. Man, yeah, that's so cool. And being able to get the uh, free media food before those games too. Oh, uh-huh. man, that's big. I used, to, yeah, I I used to sneak in those things before games. Yeah, you know, I never really had beef stroganoff before <laughs> I joined the media, and then somehow that looks okay to you when you're hungry before a game. And <laughs> yeah. you you eat some things that you, you maybe thought were not part of your repertoire. <laughs> Oh man, it's too funny. Um, I'm gonna just hit you with some quick rapid fire questions. You can just answer them quickly and uh, yeah, sure. Just buzz them on to you. Is there any quotes that you live by? Anything you just really stand firm on? Uh, probably the one more than anything else would be uh, do to others as you would have them do to you. Yeah. I mean, that, that honestly, yeah. that to me is something that has nothing to do with working in the media or working in sports. It's just a life. Uh, philosophy. Uh, I just 
feel as if it's important to treat people the right way and treat them the way that you would want to be treated. I, mm -hmm. I've always viewed life that way. I think I saw that from my dad. Uh, it didn't matter to him if it was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or if it was the guy that was cleaning up after the event. He treated them all with respect and he tried to provide them with a little laughter and uh, that carried over to me. That, that's, that's something that, that I've definitely tried to carry out throughout my life. Hey, you, you definitely do. Like, that's one thing I remember you, like, like I was saying, like, you are a light, you are a energy, and you just, you just treat people really, really well. So you, you definitely passed that test, no doubt. Well, thanks, David. I really appreciate it. Of course, man. It's just speaking the truth over here. Um, let's see. I'll hit you with another one. How about this? If you could invite three people to a dinner, dead or alive, mm. anybody, you got anybody off the top of your head? Other than me, you, know, you can leave me out of this one. I know you'd invite uh, me for beef stroganoff, but we can. I would. I would. Yeah, David, you, you'd be right there. <laughs> uh, you know, my, my dad, who I've yep. talked about quite a bit in this conversation, uh, passed away you know, nine years ago. And he would be the first guy. And just uh, one of the, the best human beings that I that I was ever around and, like and a true inspiration to me, really just good people, funny, quality person. That's cool, man. He just got it. He absolutely got it in life. So he would be one, um, you know, before all the bitterness and before all of the stuff late in his life that affected him, I, I'd be curious to sit down with Howard Cosell yeah. Uh, just based on, on my business and what made him tick, he really was – he was the guy that brought this career to another level. He was the first play-by-play -play announcer that injected his own personality into it in many ways and his own opinion. And not everybody loved him. In fact, uh, if you polled the audience of Monday Night Football when he was the guy uh, – he was often voted the most loved broadcaster in America and the most hated broadcaster in America in the mm -hmm. same poll. <laughs> so the fact that he could elicit those kinds of, of emotions is hard to believe. And he fits really more in the modern day, yet he was ahead of his time. So I, I'd be curious to sit down with him and, and get a, a sense of what, what really made him tick. And then just from a personal standpoint, I'm a huge fan of, of the musical group The Doors, uh, Jim Morrison. Nice, man. That's, yes. Yeah, that's a guy <laughs> I, I'd like to pick his brain. And, and I know that a lot of his brain was affected by uh, acid and, and mushrooms. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, yes, yeah, a <laughs> lot of drugs. But inside there was a really interesting guy that had an interesting take on life. Yeah, that's a nice dinner, man. Um, are you cooking? Can you cook? Or are you just ordering in? <laughs> yeah, exactly. we got some good New York food places out there, so we can we can order something out there. Um, one more for you. If you weren't, and I know this, this is going to be a tough one because, as you said, in the showers when you're when you were young, it was all broadcaster, all announcer. <laughs> if you weren't in announcing, um, what would you be doing? Whew. I don't know what I would be qualified to do. This is all <laughs> I ever focused on in life. Uh, I would say I think I could have been successful in the advertising field in some way. You know, I've always been a media guy. I, I've always uh, been interested in pop culture and uh, interested in what can resonate with an audience. I think I probably – could have done well in that field uh, from an idea standpoint, from yeah. soup to nuts, coming up with a campaign plan and then putting it into play, uh, maybe with some humor and done with some levity and finding something that would ring true with, with the American public. Uh, that's something that, that I think I, I might have been able to pull off if, if this didn't work out, if I had to choose a a different path nice yeah I'm, you, you could sell me anything like i said if you I, i'd buy your app if you're trying to sell me whatever <laughs> it is the way you're talking man i'm buying it so yeah you'd be good at that man um, i appreciate it david 
any any parting words? I mean, I think you were like the epitome of having a dream, being determined, not letting anybody tell you no, and making it happen. Yeah, the the one thing I would leave you with, and for the listeners, uh, certainly if you're younger and you're trying to figure it out, a couple things. One, whatever it is, you got to immerse yourself in it. Yeah, you can't just stick your toe in the pool. So whatever it is, whatever the passion that that you find, do everything to ensconce yourself in it, to really live it. For me, when when I decided that broadcasting was what I wanted to do, I watched games differently as a kid. I listened to games differently. I was listening for vernacular, for how broadcasters would use their voice, how they would inflect, how they would end a sentence, how they would take it out of commercial break. Uh, when I got to college, I started studying the backgrounds of every play-by-play announcer in the four major wow. sports. I made it my business to know where they went to college, what job they started with out of college, how they worked their way up their, the ladder. Uh, to me, it, it seems so obvious. If I wanted to join this field, I wanted to know everything there was to know about the field so that one day when I got there, it wouldn't seem obtuse to me. It would seem like something I had prepared for, something that, that I was familiar with, that, that I made sure that I was a part of. And uh, that to me just seems like such a no-brainer for whatever it is you want to do. Uh, you've got to go all in. You've, you've really got to commit to that level. The second part of that uh, would be happiness. You know, you don't mess with happiness. So how we judge success in this world, a lot of people do it financially. Uh, other people do it with uh, keeping score in their mind, competing against somebody else. Uh, to me, that's, that's really not the way you do it. It's based on your own personal happiness. If you can find joy, if you can create joy, if you can share joy, that permeates. It permeates through your family. It permeates through your friends. It permeates uh, among your work associates. Uh, you want to be that person that when they walk into a room, that people are happy to see you. You don't want to be that person that people are trying to avoid eye contact with and look the other way. Uh, it, yeah. it goes part and parcel for me. That's That's always been my mentality. So, uh, you don't mess with happiness. If you find something, if you find a formula that works for you, great. Uh, use it and and don't forget it. Don't don't forget how you got to that place. And when you're feeling down or you're feeling as if the world is against you, uh, just conjure up those images of of what got you to that happy place and recreate it and and come up with uh, the antidote. And that literally is probably the best answer i've ever got on this podcast like that's a drop the mic walk off cut it off right here that's that's really good man thank you really appreciate that um man i really appreciate your time too this this is i i could talk to you literally for the whole day and then through the evening to the bedtime story so <laughs> we could really do this well, make this happen well well that's gonna be for part two <laughs> that's and then part, part three <laughs> And then part yeah. four, we'll, we'll just keep going. We'll go different <laughs> right. stages. Oh, man. Uh, hey, is there any, anything you want to tie, like any foundations or charities, any, anything, or any way we can all follow everything, I and Eagle, um, anything? No, I'm not, I'm not a big social media guy. I made the decision because That's of good. what I told you earlier yeah. in regards to uh, putting everything you've got into something. I, I have all these jobs, which I'm really fortunate yep. to do and, and to have and to possess. I, I always thought with the social media aspect, if I jumped in on that, it would take up time and would actually restrict my time from the things I was supposed to be doing. Uh, so I, I realized yeah. that uh, it's a really important vehicle, an important tool. And if I was a 18 year old getting into broadcasting, I'm sure I would be living and breathing everything that is social media. But I, I got to a point in my career, fortunately, where I didn't have to join and I elected not to. But I understand why it's become so popular. It's, uh, it's a window into people's soul and it's a chance to share a little bit with the public. Uh, to me, if you're watching the games that I'm doing, that's enough. I get a microphone, I get live airtime, I get a chance to 
to share a little piece of myself on those NFL and NBA and college basketball and tennis broadcasts and radio broadcasts. And for me, that's, that's more than enough. Man, that's, that's what I was going to say. If you want to hear more on, uh, on, I just basically turn on a TV, watch sports and there you go. You'll get it. You will get it. That that's way. a that's a perfect <laughs> promo. Dave. You, you nailed it. Watch sports. That's yeah. The that's hashtag. It. There you go, man. Th- hey, thank you so much. I I owe you big time. Come out here to L.A. Uh, Many time, obviously, and we'll hit some food, something. Tell those guys in Brooklyn what's up for me. I will, man. You are missed, David. I love you, bud. We will uh, connect soon. I hope. Definitely, man. I'll get back out there real soon. Sounds good. Appreciate you. Huge thank you to my good friend, Ian Eagle, for coming on the podcast. A role model for anyone out there, kids, adults, literally anyone. Very blessed to have him on, and I definitely encourage you to listen to everything he is doing. Trust me on that. And don't forget to stay tuned for my bedtime storytelling app. Big thanks to Halo Neuroscience as well for sponsoring the podcast. You've got a chance to get your own today. Get them. All links in the show notes for that. And of course, the biggest thanks to all of you. You guys make this possible for me to bring on NBA players, top-level performers, and just have a ton of fun learning and growing. If you like the podcast, tell others. Give it a positive rating in iTunes. Pretty sure that helps. Heard it does. Be really cool if we could do that. But only, only if you like it, of course. I just hope you all are having as much fun as I am with it. Seriously, I'm having a ton of fun with it. Keep joining in for the ride. Teasers coming up for you, more top NBA players, even an NFL player, and some super interesting top-level performers. And if you ever have any advice, recommendations on who to bring on, questions, anything at all, any feedback is always welcome. Please hit me with it. Have a great week, and remember, it's all about the journey. David Nurse, Game of Life, signing off.